My name is James Ward, um, and in addition to my activities as a foreshore recorder, I'm also a member of the Society um, of Thames Mudlarks. As a mudlark, I have a special licence which enables me to search on areas of foreshore um, which are not accessible to standard licence holders, and also to dig to greater depth than the three inches imposed by the standard licence. Everything you see in my presentation today, however, has been found either on the surface by eye or by sieved material from the top two or three inches. And I should explain a little bit more about that um, as we go on. Um, everything of interest that I find is recorded on the National Portable Antiquities Scheme database, either by myself um, or by Stuart Wyatt, um, who is Finance Liaison Officer for London. Okay, so the area of foreshore, which I'm going to talk about today, um, is unfortunately not accessible to the general public, um, including standard licence holders, um, and the gates at the top of the stairs are consequently kept locked shut. And with reference to this map, which is uh, issued with the, uh, by the Port of London Authority uh, with the licences, um, we're um, searching on the, uh, we're, we're operating on the yellow sections um, that you see on the North Bank there, um, where searching is permitted. Okay, so those of you not familiar, this is the Millennium Pier um, at the Tower of London. You can just see the Tower of London in the background there. Um, and I believe this part of the foreshore is special as it's protected from the severe erosion that's occurred elsewhere um, on the river by the pontoons of Tower Pier, which you can just see um, to the right there. here. So as a consequence, um, I've been lucky enough to have discovered an extraordinary variety um, of small metal objects from here, ranging from the Roman period um, up to the approximate end of the 17th century in terms of, uh, of interest. And the objective of my presentation today is to share some of these with you um, and also put forward some arguments um, as to how they might have got there. So we're down on the foreshore now. Uh, this is looking back up at the uh, at tower stairs. Remember this for a little bit later because I think this is this is important. Uh, this is a view now looking from the low water mark, um, looking downstream. You can see uh, Tower Bridge in the background, uh, the Tower of London on the left, um, and this is the view upstream looking back up towards the West End. Okay, so there's three main areas of, 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 of interest here on this patch of the foreshore. Um, we're looking at sieving um, on this patch here along the shingle line, <coughs> which essentially involves uh, the use of just a standard garden sieve, and you rake off the top um, loose layer of, of rocks and pebbles, scoop up the, the, the material um, underneath, uh, place it in the sieve, wash it out in the river, um, and then pick out the, uh, the items of interest um, that get left behind, um, and that can get very exciting uh, <coughs> when you're on a good patch. So that's sieved along that patch, um, and then we've got this patch here directly in front of the uh, of, of the shingle line, which is which is just eyes only, um, essentially looking for um, the items that have washed out of the shingle bank um, above, um, and then a little bit further um, upstream. Um, we've got a combination of sieving and eyes only on this section here. So, what do we find? This represents three years of searching um, with uh, 27 visits in total. Um, and you can see from there, there's uh, quite a wide variety um, of different bits and pieces just from this one small patch on foreshore. So, because we're time limited today, I'm going to concentrate um, initially on the silver coins which I found from here. Um, then we'll have a look at some components of what I believe are medieval knives. We'll look at some dress accessories uh, and also some coin fragments. There's an enormous amount of coin fragments from this part of the foreshore for some reason. Um, and then we'll finish up with uh, trade tokens. So looking at the silver coins, these are predominantly uh, 
farthings and half pence uh, with a few pence scattered in there, uh, mostly from the Tower Mint. Um, the only thing I would say about this medieval bias is that, um, unless stated otherwise, um, all of the identifications have been by myself, um, which means there's probably lots of mistakes in there, um, and so that may be incorrect also. Um, and then in terms of conditions, I've deliberately put the best ones in the presentation, so there's a lot more that aren't shown in this presentation, um, it, it, which are a lot more battered in terms of condition. So, getting into the silver coins, um, I believe these are casual losses. This is a Henry III uh, cut halfpenny. It's been clipped, so it's clearly been in circulation before it was lost. Cut folding. Now, the sharp eyed amongst you might be able to make out on here an, uh, uh, an I or a J and an O on here, and maybe a H which suggests maybe King John. Unfortunately, all the coins of this period, as I understand, were stamped with Henry. So this is probably the, this is probably the moneyer and would have been Johan. So moving on. <coughs> this one was minted in Calais, so this isn't local. It must have been in circulation before it was lost. Another Henry VI. Henry VIII. These were in pretty poor condition, I believe, even when they were when, when they were new. Um, and again, a bit difficult to identify, but I think um, it, it's his hair on this one that gives the gun away. <laughs> it's, I think it's called brush hair or something. It looks like hair brush. So moving on, wide range of different uh, coins. This one's in lovely condition. This one must have been quite um, must have been lost shortly after it was issued. Um, if that one's a casual loss, that one's uh, really quite good. You can see the thistle on that one and the, and the rose of England. <coughs> Charlie. Um, right up to uh, the Commonwealth period. Okay, so moving on now to these knife handle um, end plates. Uh, what these are, um, I believe, are from medieval knives. Um, and they're interesting. Oh, and, and, and yeah. So where, where they fit, they, they 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 go on scale tang knives, where the where where the tang um, from the blade extends right up through the handle, um, and then the grips are riveted on each side of the handle, as you can see there. And then the end plate um, just finishes it off, keeps it all together, and finishes it at the end. And that's what I believe these are. <coughs> Um, there's some more pictures of them there from the Museum of London from the medieval period. Um, now, some of these, and I don't know if you can see, I've tried to highlight it here on this one, and on this one, I've clearly got the impression of the tang impressed into the end plate there. So they must have been part of a complete uh, knife when they were either lost um, or thrown away into the river and they've subsequently fallen to pieces. Some of the others, however, clearly don't have that, and I think these may be um, cutler's stock, um, and they may have been just hold for keeping on wire, um, and maybe evidence, perhaps, of activity going on, perhaps by a chap like this, um, up on the top of the river, um, maybe in the Tower of London or close by, um, and, and these have ended up in the river here. Now, I've never found these anywhere other than the, the, this point, uh, this patch on the foreshore, um, that we're talking about. So just to back that up, <coughs> these are, as I understand, uh, shoe buckles and uh, lace chapes. Um, there's a couple of good ones here, and some, uh, and some chapes. Um, now these, I believe, date to the 15th, 16th centuries. Um, particularly the lace chapes are quite common, um, and you find those quite a lot um, around the foreshore. They get a bit twisted and bent and, and, and uh, deformed. But if you look to the ones on the left here... Sorry, that's the wrong way. 
these ones here, you could see they're absolutely, they, they look to me like sweepings off the, off the floor of a workshop that have ended up in a river. They're, 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 they're much different to, to, the, to these examples that, you can, that, that, that are on the right here. Um, and definitely with the shoe buckles, I'm convinced that that hasn't happened as a result of being in the river. Somebody's done that to that, to that <coughs> buckle before it's gone in the river. So again, it's, it's that evidence of um, activities going on uh, 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 above this area of the foreshore um, on the river wall. Okay, have a look at coin fragments now. Two main types, rose farthings um, and uh, silver coins. We'll start with the rose farthings. Okay, so this is a good one. Um, now I've been doing this searching for stuff for about 10 years um, and rose farthings are the most prolific coin that I find. Um, I've got dozens um, and almost without exception they're intact, not that one. Um, so they're robust little coins. So why is it in this particular patch there's so many fragments and, and I think I've found at least, well certainly more than 30 of, of different <coughs> fragments of coins. Now as I understand it the token house was up in the tower um, so do they, could they possibly be rejects from the tower the waste that's ended up in a river as part of the, uh, of the minting process likewise for the silver coins I've managed to identify some of these and you can see from these compared to the ones that I showed you at the beginning of my presentation they're in much much different condition these are it, as I it's difficult to do this to coins I believe and I wonder if it has been if, if that has happened as a result of them being in the in the foreshore or if they've gone in like that again as, as maybe rejects from the mint um, above in the Tower of London you would have thought however that as of today silver and brass and copper would have had a, an intrinsic value um, and, and, and wouldn't have ended up swept into the river but, so the jury's out on that one still ok so moving on there may be people sitting amongst you who are thinking well that's all very well but that could have come from anywhere all that stuff <coughs> the river's quite dynamic and things end up washed and, 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 and rinsed about and end up all over the place so see what you think about this in um, October 2016, I found this. Now, these are um, trade tokens that were issued between 1648 and 1672 um, as a result of, of, of a sh severe sh shortage of, of, of change, small change, at that, in that period. And they were issued by traders and merchants and, and publicans and, and the like. Um, and they generally have the issuer's name, um, sometimes they have a date. Um, and the place of, uh, of the business and sometimes also um, <coughs> yes the initials the initials um, of, of, of his spouse so this one um, I'll highlight it here from you it was issued by Thomas Stairs um, in the Bulwark in 1653 so Nothing particularly interesting about that still, you might think. Until we have a look at a map of the Tower of London. Um, this one's dated to around about 1600 or thereabouts. Um, and we realise that this area here is actually the bulwark. Now, remember I said this bit was important. And I think the reason for that is, is because if you look at it on this map, I believe that it hasn't changed significantly... <laughs> Um, in its profile um, since at least this time so if you put on the fine spot um, and then look at these buildings up here highlighted in blue there's every poss possibility that you're now looking at the premises occupied by Thomas Stairs in one of those in 1653 so is that evidence that all the rest of the staff down there <coughs> in that position um, it's contemporary with what was going on above 
or is that just a happy coincidence? And that's what a bulwark looks like now. <laughs> Okay, so as, as a counter argument um, to that, perhaps um, I've put these ones in. These are some others that I found in this in, in this um, area, um, and I've put them in because they're they're, they're really quite nice. Um, this one was issued by Thomas Wickenden in Seven Oaks, and this one by Joseph Griffith in Southwark. Um, now they may have been just casual losses, perhaps for trade that was going on in that area. Um, or they might just have been thrown away into the river um, when they were made um, illegal in, in 1672, I believe. Okay, so nearly there now. So on occasion, I would get to this to, 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 to the place on the river here, and, and the tide wasn't low enough to start searching, um, and so I would have a wander up to the other end while I waited for the tide to drop um, up to this end. Um, now this is strictly... Um, eyes only territory up here there's no, no scraping, no digging no surface disturbance at all uh, mudlarks only um, and on this occasion I had a wander up there put my bucket down and picked up this and I thought oh that looks like a scrap of lead um, that might possibly be a badge and then I turned it over and this is of course rather fabulous pilgrim's badge of Thomas the Beckett. Now if you thought that was good, six months later <laughs> I found another one back down on our patch which we've been talking about. And a little confession to make here, the reason it's in two pieces is because I've stood on it before I, <laughs> before I spotted it. So I'm sure there's a, there's a story to be had with just those two but that's going to have to wait until next time. 